Views and opinions expressed on this program are those of the guests appearing on the program and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of 8 News Now or Next Star Media Group. I don't think there's any justice for the victims who are innocent in those crimes. Tonight on Politics Now, Nevada's race for Attorney General heats up. We speak with Republican candidate Tisha Black. The Culinary Union pushes for rent control, what its ballot initiative would do, and who's opposing it. I cheated, Joe. Forgive me, I, we're not using profanity. Video of a Clark County School Board meeting draws quick criticism from Republicans. What was said during a school assignment. From 8 News Now, this is Politics Now. Thank you for joining us. I'm John Langler. Your primary mail-in ballot should arrive next week, just before early voting starts. And 8 News Now is hosting a Republican governor debate. It'll be Wednesday, May 25th at 7 o'clock in the evening, right here on Channel 8. The debate is being monitored by anchor, or moderated rather, by anchor Denise Valdez, I-team reporter Vanessa Murphy, and politics and government editor at the Las Vegas Review-Journal, Steve Sibelius. Joe Lombardo, Joey Gilbert, Dean Heller, John Lee and Guy Nora are all confirmed to take part in the debate. A reminder, early voting starts May 28th for the primary. The Culinary Union is working to get rent control, an initiative on the ballot. Now, this initiative is just in North Las Vegas. It's called the Neighborhood Stability Initiative. If approved, it would tie maximum rent increases to the Consumer Price Index. Rent would only be allowed to go up a maximum of 5% year to year. It's the latest of about a half dozen rent control initiatives across the country this year. The Nevada State Apartment Association immediately came out against it. Signatures are still needed, though, to get this on the November ballot. Nevada's Republican Attorney General primary is heating up. The winner will take on incumbent Democrat Attorney General Aaron Ford. A few months ago, we spoke with attorney and Republican candidate Seagal Chatta, challenging her in the Republican primary, attorney and business owner Tisha Black. I spoke with her about the contest. When you talk about being soft on crime, uh, what are some examples of that, in your opinion? So, um, our attorney general um, testified in favor of a bill that was 157 pages of a criminal omnibus bill, and that bill changed uh, bail reform uh, to change it from the presumption of one should have bail to one should not have bail, um, changed the uh, drug trafficking limits from 10 grams to 100 grams. So if you have 101 grams of an illegal substance, you will be charged with drug trafficking, um, whereas before you had to have 11. Um, there's, you know, we went from a three strike state to a seven strike state. Um, you know, in California where they have $950 to, um, that you can get away with for organized retail crime or retail crime here, it's, it's, it's uh, 1,200. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that, a soft, that the Attorney General Ford has done that have moved our focus away from victims and on to perpetrators. And that is not, it's not good for our children. It's not good for our community. What makes you, in your opinion, more qualified to earn the Republican nomination? Um, a number of things. I, so the Attorney General's office is the, is the largest office, um, the largest law firm in the state. And I have run a law firm, my own law firm, for 23 years, and it is statewide. Uh, my opponent has not. My opponent is what we call in the field basically a single shingle. She employs herself and a secretary. Um, and I think she's done very, you know, very well for her business as a criminal defense attorney, or excuse me, a, a yeah, a criminal defense attorney. She's largely spent most of her time. Um, defending some of our most notorious criminals in the state of Nevada. Um, she defends uh, DUI defense, um, felony drug trafficking. Um, for the last 20 years, she's essentially undermined our police, um, the, the jobs of our, the job that our police have done, excuse me, and wasted taxpayers money. So I, while I think she's a good job, you know, a criminal defense attorney, I just don't see somebody who spent their life defending crime and criminals 
as being the top cop in the state. Would you have pursued similar litigation over mask mandates, vaccinations, and other state uh, uh, efforts that were put in place for coronavirus? Would I have pursued it as attorney general? 100%. What I was doing when we were all in COVID was preserving jobs and helping my client keep their businesses. So I didn't have, I have um, my clientele who is a priority. Um, it was my obligation as their attorney to make sure that we were doing everything to fight against the ridiculous foreclosures and make sure that these people who put their life savings into their businesses could keep them open. Our full interview with Tisha Black is available on 8newsnow.com. We also have a discussion with her Republican opponent, Sigal Chatta. Both of those are under the politics tab under news on 8newsnow.com. Clark County School District is now investigating a mother's claim about pornographic assignments that her daughter was given to read. One in particular, the popular conservative Twitter account Libs of TikTok sent out this video this week. It's from the May 12th school board meeting. The libs of TikTok account bleeped one word. Now we're going to warn you, we're going to play this uncensored version. This will be horrifying for me to read to you, but that will give you perspective on how she must have felt when her teacher required her to memorize this and to act it out in front of her entire class. I don't love you. It's not you. It's just, I don't like your dick or any dick in that case. I cheated, Joe. Forgive me, I, we're not using profanity. Now that woman was allowed to go on with her complaint, but she couldn't keep reading from that paper. The video sparked condemnations from Republican candidates, from Joe Lombardo running for governor, Adam Laxalt for Senate, uh, Guy Nora, who is running also for uh, governor as well, the state Republican Party. CCSD says it is still looking into the claim, but it was written, an assignment written by another student. We have a full link to the video at 8newsnow.com. From the 8 News Now I team, Nye County Commissioners have voted to move its courthouse. It's a decision that comes after concerns were raised by judges about guns and weapons being allowed in the county government building. Last year, the commissioners unanimously voted to remove a judicial order banning firearms in that Nye County complex. The complex houses the District Court and Pahrump Justice Court. Judges believe they're sitting ducks and that weapons should not be allowed in the building. Commissioners say the judge's order banning weapons and guns violates Second Amendment rights. Why are we not enforcing this and putting the judges in their place? Why are they allowed to do this when they can put people in prison for life and we can't do anything back? Some commissioners say moving the court's a good move anyway because it's running out of space. A county attorney warned commissioners taking the gun issue to the high court would be expensive, but they added moving the courts would be costly as well. Nevada's congressional delegation is still pressing the Biden administration on solar tariffs. The White House is looking at solar panel imports from Malaysia, Vietnam, Thailand and Cambodia. Congresswoman Susie Lee says the end result could be higher tariffs. Nevada's solar industry employs about 6,000 people. Companies say about 70% of those jobs would be threatened by those higher tariffs. Next year on Politics Now, finding out what's out there. What was said during Congress's first public hearing on UFOs in 50 years. And our own George Knapp helps us break down what we learned and what we didn't learn from the
Conditions and dealer fees are extra. Welcome back to Politics Now. We want to know what's out there as much as you want to know what's out there. For the first time in five decades, this week, Congress held its first public hearing on UFOs. Defense officials told lawmakers on Capitol Hill they have 400 reports from military personnel of unidentified flying objects. While they can explain some, well, they can't explain others. Washington, D.C. correspondent Alex Limon was there. There's a good thing. In the first hearing of its kind in 50 years, defense officials confirmed sightings of unidentified flying objects, or as the military calls them, UAPs. But... We have detected no emanations uh, within the UAP task force that, that, is, uh, that would suggest it's anything non-terrestrial. Officials said there have been no collisions between U.S. aircraft and the objects, but there have been 11 near misses. And have we attempted to communicate with those objects? No. We don't even put out a alert saying, you know, identify yourself. Some of the objects, like the triangles in this video, were later classified as drones. But defense officials said there are sightings they still can't explain. The Defense Department says it is taking reports seriously and that it continues to expand its office that's gathering and analyzing reports of UFOs. This is not about finding alien spacecraft, but about delivering dominant intelligence. Some lawmakers said the sightings could be evidence of secret U.S. or foreign technology. But California Congressman Adam Schiff was unsure. There is something there, measurable by multiple instruments, and yet it seems to move in directions that are inconsistent with what we know of physics or science. We're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots to the west. After the public hearing, a classified version of the hearing on UFOs continued behind closed doors. In Washington, Alexandra Limon. Might be fair to say a lot of the discussion about UFOs in Washington wouldn't be here, uh, wouldn't be happening without the reporting of our own George Knapp. George, good to see you. John. All right, so uh, just the fact that the, these hearings even happened is a big step. What did you take away from what you saw in Capitol Hill with regards to UFOs? Well, you know, I am a glasses half empty guy. I am pessimistic by nature, but I would say, and I told people you should temper your expectations about what this uh, hearing is going to do, but even it was lower than the bar that I set, which was pretty low to begin with. The fact that it happened at all is amazing. You know, it's been 54 years since the last public hearing, uh, and you know, the public is interested in this. They've made it pretty clear over the last couple of years. Since January of 2018, there have been multiple behind closed doors classified briefings for members of Congress. Started with their senior staff members, armed services and intelligence committees, and then expanded as it became kind of a hot item on Capitol Hill. Uh, it may be the only bipartisan issue on Capitol Hill these days because lawmakers of both parties have come out of these briefings and they look like they're de deer in the headlights kind of a look after they've been shown videos, photos, documents, files, things that the public has not been able to see yet. But, you know, in general, when they come out of those things, they've said, this is really important. That's that's why we had a public hearing. That said, uh, that's the good part. The bad part is they didn't tell us much of anything. They had two guys there who are basically spokespersons who clearly did not have much of a command of the history of the topic, didn't know about really big cases at all. I don't get the sense that either one of them have ever been out in the field, done any actual investigations. They're telling us things they learned from other people, and that was kind of a disappointment. So this is just lip service. Yeah, which is what this has been for 75 years, yeah. you know. Uh, I, I call it uh, sort of swamp gassy because that was the, the famous explanation for a UFO case that Project Blue Book came out with years ago. Oh, that must have been swamp gas. And people see these things in the sky, they're not damn good and well it's not swamp gas. They've demanded transparency for a long time. That's become more of a battle cry over the last couple of years. And I think the public in general was disappointed by what they heard. What would you like to hear? What do you think the public deserves to hear and know about UFOs and, and all the information you've obviously seen? What, what do you want to hear the government acknowledge? Well, these guys were asked point blank, hey, what other programs existed between 
Project Blue Book, which ended in 1969, and ATIP, which supposedly ended in 2017, they said there aren't any. That is just baloney. It started here. The reason they're having a, a, a hearing in Washington is because the research and the investigation that started here in Las Vegas. Harry Reid gets the $22 million for a program called OSAP. It was managed by the Defense Intelligence Agency. They put together the biggest UFO database in the history of the world, 200,000 cases. These folks are completely unaware, blissfully unaware, that any of that information exists. They put together, by the way, uh, the best investigators in the world to tackle this boots on the ground kind of people um, that we've talked to a lot of them and those are the ones you want to hear the guys who have been out in the field doing the research who've collected this information who've seen the videos tell them uh, let them tell Congress what they've seen you mentioned uh, late Senator Reid obviously you spoke with him a lot about this issue and making this public is it possible this is just sort of the, the opening salvo this is the beginning and there's more to come that's what I hope I, I really do hope that I mean our government, our military in particular, has studied this issue behind the scenes for seven decades, and they've told us there's nothing to it, go away, no big deal. They've lied. And I guess probably nobody from the Pentagon wants to stand up and tell uh, the Congress or the American public, yeah, we've been lying through our teeth, but they have. So, yeah, I'd like to see witnesses, boots on the ground, investigations. The, the public wants it. Uh, members of Congress seem to want it, and the Pentagon is not going to give it up unless p the public and Congress make them give it up. So, yeah, I hope this is just the start. All right, not over yet. George, good to see you again. Appreciate you it. You too, John. Watch George's uh, many years of covering UFOs on either the iTeam page at 8newsnow.com. There's also mysterywire.com. There's a lot to see. Next year on Politics Now, staying in America, a new bill in Congress to try and protect documented dreamers. Plus, legal side hustles. How can a state lawmaker work for a prosecutor's office? A new state Supreme Court ruling sheds some light on that issue next on Election Headquarters. You're watching Politics Now. Welcome back. Can county prosecutors also serve in Nevada's state legislature? It's a question two Nevada Supreme Court justices gave a partial answer to this week. It came in a dissenting opinion on a sexual assault case. State Senator Melanie Shibley is the prosecutor. The defendant appealed the prosecution, saying she shouldn't be able to write the laws and enforce them. And two justices agreed. The other five say the separation of powers case, which is underway, should be handled separately. Still, this gives some insight into how at least two of the justices are likely to vote in that separation of powers case. Now, that case also involves state Senate Majority Leader and Clark County Prosecutor Nicole Canizaro. 
Hundreds of thousands of young people who came to the U.S. under their parents' visas face deportation when they age out of the system. There are just few options for them. Washington correspondent Alexander Limon looks into legislation which could help these young people and help our job market. Democratic lawmakers are pushing for a bill to protect young immigrants not covered by DACA, who call themselves documented dreamers. I'm scared that when I graduate from my PhD, that I will have to self-deport to India. They came to the U.S. legally on their parents' visas. Their parents' green card applications are stuck in backlogs that are sometimes more than 50 years long. Once they turn 21, these young people lose their legal status. You now have to self-deport to a country that you may have no rec recollection of. If they remain in the U.S., they become undocumented immigrants. More than 200,000 documented dreamers across the country who are living in limbo. Senator Dick Durbin says the U.S. needs these soon-to-be young professionals. Think about how many times we've been told we don't have the workforce we need. We're desperate to find people to fill the jobs. While Congress has been unable to pass comprehensive immigration reform for decades, this group of Democrats is hopeful that this more narrow legislation has a real shot at passing. The bill would allow people like Millie Herrera to apply for green cards. Aging out of the system at 21 means disrupting my path in higher education. It makes applying to colleges a lot more complicated. And it makes my future a moving target. With bipartisan co-sponsors, supporters believe the legislation can get enough votes to become law. In Washington, Alexandra Limon. Joining us to talk more about this bill, Alex Limon from our Washington, D.C. Bureau. Alex, uh, since this covers people not covered by DACA, can you give us an example of who would be able to apply for this? Yes, yeah, so in addition to having to have been brought here as children by parents who were, you know, specialty visa holders, um, in order to be approved, these people would have had to also maintain uh, residency in the United States for the past 10 years. Uh, they will also be required to uh, be graduates of colleges or universities um, in order to be able to apply for green cards under this program if it is approved by Congress. Immigration is notoriously partisan. It has been for a while. What are the sticking points for Republicans on this one? So, you know, we haven't heard a lot of um, opposition, at least not strong opposition, um, to this specific bill, you know, that in addition to, I should mention, uh, providing a pathway to green cards would also give work permits to uh, those who are 16 and older. And the reason that we haven't heard a lot of opposition is because, um, as we heard some of the people in that story say, the United States um, needs these types of future high-skilled workers who are getting this American education. And so um, everyone kind of agrees that it would even be, you know, in the country and the uh, labor market's best interest to help them to stay here. But what Republicans are saying is that they hope that Democrats will be able to uh, compromise on certain issues. Uh, it's likely that this would have to be, you know, rolled into a bigger package that maybe includes some border security measures in order to sort of guarantee that the package would get all of the votes needed in the Senate. So Republicans Republicans say, you know, they don't oppose the bill itself, but hopefully uh, they can get some border security measures to go along with it. And then it is likely that we could see something uh, narrow like this bill pass. All right. Alex Simone from Washington, D.C. Thank you very much. President Joe Biden's job approval in Nevada still very much underwater. The latest civics poll, take a look at these numbers here, shows just 32 percent of Nevadans approve of the job that President Joe Biden is doing. 59% do not approve. That is below national numbers, which are 34 and 55% respectively. More politics now.
745 cash. Here's a look at what we're watching for next week. It is, of course, our Republican primary gubernatorial debate Wednesday right here on 8 News Now. Sheriff Joe Lombardo leads in the latest polling. This is, though, his first televised debate in this race. Uh, this is the first time all five of the leading candidates have committed to this uh, race, uh, to this debate, I beg your pardon. Again, that'll be Wednesday, 7 o'clock, right here on Channel 8. I'll be hosting a debate preview as well, starting before the program at a quarter to 7. Also, you should start receiving mail-in ballots this week for the primary. Early voting starts May 28th. It runs for two weeks. And then the primary election, that's June 14th. Just remember, you don't have to go to a specific early voting location or any specific location on Election Day. And we also have same-day registration here in Nevada. It's all uh, happening here before the primary in June. It'll be a very big week. We hope you will join us for that. But that'll do it for us this week here on Politics Now. Stay up to date online at 8newsnow.com. We'll be back with you Saturday with a complete recap. Take care.